Philip Pirip, usually called Pip, knew about his father and mother and his five little brothers was from seeing their tombstones in the churchyard. He was cared for by his sister, who was 20 years older than himself. She had married a blacksmith named Joe Gagri, a kind, good man, while she, unfortunately, was a hard, stern woman and treated her little brother and her amiable husband with great harshness. They lived in a marshy part of the country, about 20 miles from the sea. One cold, raw day towards evening, when Pip was about six years old, he had wandered into the churchyard and was trying to make out what he could of the inscriptions on his family tombstones. The darkness was coming on, and feeling very lonely and frightened, he began to cry. Hold your eyes! cried a terrible voice, and a man started up from among the graves close to him. Keep still, you little one, or I'll cut your throat. He was a dreadful looking man, dressed in coarse grey cloth, with a great iron on his leg, wet, muddy and miserable. He limped and shivered and glared and growled. His teeth shattered in his head as he seized Pip by the chin. Oh, don't cut my throat, sir, cried Pip in terror. Pray, don't do it, sir. Tell us your name. Said the man. Quick. Pip, sir. Once more. Said the man staring at him. Give it mouth. Pip. Pip, sir. Show us where you live. Said the man. Point out the place. Pip showed him the village about a mile or more from the church. The man looked at him for a moment and then he quickly emptied his pockets. He found nothing in them but a piece of bread which he ate ravenously. You young dog, said the man licking his lips. What fat cheeks you have got. Darn me if I couldn't eat them and if I had to have half a mind too. Pip said earnestly that he hoped he would not. Look at this man, my sherry of food. The boy with pets of eating him. See? Yada, you are right. Oh, looky here, said the man. Where's your mother? There, sir, said Pip. At this, the man started and seemed about to run away, but stopped and looked over his shoulder. There, sir, explained Pip, showing him the tombstone. Oh, and is that your father along with your mother? Yes, sir, said Pip. Oh my God, this boy's parents are dead. Such a sad fellow. I know, even this convict is getting angry with poor Pip. Ha! Ah! muttered the man. Then who deserves it? Supposing you kindly let me live, which I haven't not made up my mind about. My sister, sir, Miss Jo Gargari, wife of Jo Gargari, the blacksmith, sir. Blacksmith, eh? said the man and looked down at his leg. Then he seized the trembling little boy by both arms and glaring down at him, he said, Now looky here, the question being whether you are to be left to live is if you can get something for me. Yes, sir. Do you want the police? No, I want... A pet, sir? No, I want a file. You know what a file is, you know what I Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. And do you know what, what to, sir? Yes, sir. You get me a pulse as, and you get me whittles. You bring them both to me. All this time, he was tilting poor Pip backwards till he was so dreadfully frightened and giddy that he clung to the man with both hands. You bring me tomorrow morning early the file and the whittles. You do it and you never dare to say a word or dare to make a sign concerning your having seen such a person as me or any person from ever and you shall be left to live. Then he threatened all sorts of dreadful and terrible things to poor Pip if he failed to do all that he commanded and made him solemnly promise to bring him what he wanted and to keep the secret. Then he let him go, saying, 
You remember what you want to do and you get home. Good night, sir. Faltered Zip. Much of that, said he, glancing over the cold, wet flat. I wish I was a frog or a eel. This is getting interesting. Let us see what Pip does. Yeah, it is very interesting. Poor Pip passed a wretched night thinking of the dreadful promise he had made. And as soon as it was beginning to get light outside, he got up and crept downstairs, fancying that every boat creaked out. Stop, thief! And Get up, Miss Joe! As quickly as he could, he took some bread, some rind of cheese, about half a jar of mincemeat, which he tied up in a handkerchief, with a slice of bread and butter, some brandy from a stone bottle, a meat bone with very little meat on it, and a pie which he found on an upper shelf. Then he got a file from among Joe's stools and ran for the marshes. Wow, all of that sounds so good. I wish I was a convict. Oh, wait, if I was a convict, I would be in jail. Ha <laughs> ha, you're so funny, Adivit. Pip was soon at the place of meeting after that, and there was the man, hugging himself and limping to and fro, as if he had never all night left off hugging and limping. He was awfully cold, to be sure. Pip had half expected to see him drop down before his eyes and die of cold. His eyes looked so awfully hungry too, that when Pip handed him the file, it occurred to him he would have tried to eat it if he had not seen the bundle. He did not turn Pip upside down this time to get at what he had, but left him right side upward while he opened the bundle and emptied his pockets. What's in the bundle, boy? Said he. Brandy. Said Pip, who was already handing mincemeat down his throat in the most curious manner, more like a man who was putting it away somewhere in a violent hurry than a man who was eating it. But he left off to take some of the liquor, shivering all the while so violently that it was quite as much as he could do to keep the neck of the bottle between his teeth. I think you have got the chills, said Pip. I'm much of your opinion, boy, said he. He was gobbling mincemeat, meat bone, bread, cheese and pie all at once, staring distractedly while he did so at the mist all around and often stopping, even stopping his jaws to listen. Some real and fancy itself, some clink up on the river or breathing a beast upon the marsh now gave him a start and he said suddenly, You're not a false friend. You brought no one with you. No, sir. No. Nor told there nobody to follow you. No. Well, said he, I believe you. Pitying his desolation and watching him as he gradually settled down upon the pipe, Pip made bold to say, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Did you spray? I said I was glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, my boy. I do. Pip had often watched a large dog eating his food, and he now noticed a decided similarity between the dog's way of eating and the man's. The man took strong, sharp, sudden bites, just like the dog. He swallowed or rather snapped up every mouthful too soon and too fast. He looked sideways here and there while he ate, as if he thought there was danger of somebody coming to take the pie away. He was altogether too unsettled in his mind over it to enjoy it comfortably. Pip thought ought to have anybody to dine with him without making a job with his jaws at the visitor, in all of which particular he was very like the dog. Pip watched him trying to file the iron off his leg, and then being afraid of stopping longer away from home, he ran off.
Darkness was coming on and feeling very lonely and frightened, he began to cry. Oh my god, Shri Krishnan, what are you doing? Why is your brother tickling you? With a great iron on his chest, wet, muddy and miserable, he limped and shivered and glared and growled.